right. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Saturday Morning Mastermind. I'm your host today, Samantha Studebaker Carl. And I'm here with my good friends, Lori and Catherine. And today we're going to continue our discussion of the book, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. And um, I th we are on page 131 in the hard copy. Is that the same page for you, Catherine? Or you said like 130 something in Kindle. I don't know. 130 Somewhere. in Kindle. Somewhere in there. In Kindle. 130. At the top, that so the, the title for that page says, The Frustration of Not Finding a Library When You Really Need One. <clears throat> so, but before we get going, I want to give my friends an opportunity to introduce themselves. And then, uh, Catherine, you can take it from there and we'll just start reading. Lori Emmons in Denver on video for a change. Hey. <laughs> And this is Catherine Clement on video for a change. <laughs> okay, I'll get started here. I just want to remind everybody of what was happening uh, when we left. Because Nora asked the librarian to put her into the one where she was a glaciologist. She wanted a life where she was a glaciologist. And so she winds up uh, in this where we're at now, she was actually on bear watch. So the other scientists had gone off to do what they were going to do. And it was her job to stand there and look out for polar bears. She had a gun and a flare and she, and she was supposed to watch out for polar bears and put up the flare and shoot one if she had to. So she hadn't seen any, but all of a sudden she heard this noise and thought it was a walrus, but it wasn't a walrus. So this is where the frustration of not finding a library when you really need one. The fog cleared to reveal a huge white bear standing upright. It dropped down to all fours and continued moving towards her with surprising velocity and a heavy and terrifying grace. Nora did nothing. Her mind was jammed with panic. She was as still as the permafrost she stood on. Fuck. Fuck, fuck. Fuck, fuck, fucking fuck. Fuck, 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 fuck. Eventually, a survival impulse kicked in and Nora raised the signal pistol and fired it. And the flare shot out like a tiny comet and disappeared into the water, the glow fading along with her hope. The creature was still coming towards her. She fell to her knees and started clanging the ladle against the saucepan and shouted at the top of her lungs, Bear! 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 The bear stopped momentarily. Bear! 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 It was now walking forward again. The banging wasn't working. The bear was close. She wondered if she could reach the rifle lying on the ice just slightly too far away. She could see the bear's vast, pawed feet armed with claws, pressing into the snow-dusted rock. Its head was low, and its black eyes were looking directly at her. Library, Nora, sc Nora screamed. Mrs. Elm, please, send me back. This is the wrong life. It is really, really, really wrong. Take me back. I don't want adventure. Where's the library? I want the library. There was no hatred in the polar bear's stare. Nora was just food, meat, and that was a humbling kind of terror. Her heart pounded like a drummer reaching the, cres the crescendo, the end of the song, and it became astoundingly clear to her, finally, in that moment. She didn't want to die. And that was the problem. In the face of death, life seemed more attractive. And as life seemed more attractive, how could she get back to the Midnight Library? She had to be disappointed in a life, not just scared of it, in order to try again with another book. There was death, violent, oblivious death in bear form, staring at her with its black eyes. And she knew then, more than she'd known anything, that she wasn't ready to die. This knowledge grew bigger than fear itself as she stood there, face to face with the polar bear, itself hungry and desperate to exist, and banged the ladle against the saucepan. Harder, a fast staccato, bang, bang, bang. 
I'm not scared. 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 The bear stood and stared the way the walrus had. She glanced at the rifle. Yes, it was too far away. By the time she could grab it and work out how to fire it, it would already be too late. She doubted she'd be able to kill a polar bear anyway, so she banged the ladle. Nora closed her eyes, wishing for the library as she carried on making noise. When she opened them, the bear was slipping headfirst into the water. She kept banging the saucepan, even after the creature had disappeared. <clears throat> About a minute later, she heard the humans calling her name through the fog. Give me just a second. <laughs> All right, Island. She was in shock but it was a slightly different kind of shock than the others on the dinghy assumed. It wasn't the shock of having been close to death. It was the shock of realizing she actually wanted to live. They passed a small island teeming with nature. Green lichens spread over the rocks. Birds and little auks and puffins clustered together, huddled against the Arctic wind. Life surviving against the odds. Nora sipped the coffee that Hugo handed her, fresh from his flask, holding it with cold hands, even under three pairs of gloves. To be part of nature was to be part of the will to live. When you stay too long in a place, you forget just how big an expanse the world is. You get no sense of the length of those long longitudes and latitudes, just as she supposed it is hard to have a sense of the vastness inside any one person. But once you sense that vastness, once something reveals it, hope emerges, whether you want it to or not, and it clings to you as stubbornly as lichen clings to rock. Permafrost. The surface air temperatures in Svalbard were warming at twice the global rate. Climate change was happening faster here than almost anywhere on Earth. One woman, wearing a purple woolen hat pulled down over her eyebrows, talked about witnessing one of the icebergs doing a somersault, something that happened apparently because the warming waters had dissolved it from beneath, causing it to become top-heavy. Another problem was that the permafrost on the land was thawing, softening the ground, leading to landslides and avalanches that could destroy the wooden houses of Longyearbyen, the largest town in Svalbard. There was also a risk of bodies surfacing in the local cemetery. It was inspiring being among the scientists who were trying to discover precisely what was happening to the planet, trying to observe glacial and climatic activity, and in doing, and in so doing, to inform and to protect life on Earth. Back on the main boat, Nora sat quietly in the dining area as everyone offered sympathy for the bear encounter. She felt unable to tell them she was grateful for the experience. She just smiled politely and did her best to avoid conversation. This life was an intense one, without compromise. It was currently minus 17 degrees, and she had nearly been eaten by a polar bear. And yet, maybe the problem with her root life had partly been its blandness. She had come to imagine mediocrity and disappointment were her destiny. Indeed, Nora had always had the sense that she came from a long line of regrets and crushed hopes that seemed to echo in every generation. For instance, her grandfather on her mother's side was called Lorenzo Conte. He had left Puglia, the handsome heel in the boot of Italy, to come to swinging London in the 1960s. Like other men in the desolate port town of Bredizzi, He'd emigrated to Britain, exchanging life on the Adriatic for a job at the London Brick Company. Lorenzo, in his naivety, had imagined having a wonderful life, baking bricks all day, and then, of an evening, he would rub shoulders with the Beatles and walk arm in arm down Carnaby Street with Jean Shrimpton or Marianne Faithful. 
The only problem was that despite its name, the London Brick Company wasn't actually in London. It was based 60 miles north in Bedford, which for all its modest charms turned out not as swinging as Lorenzo would have liked. But he made a compromise with his dreams and settled there. Work may not have been glamorous, but it paid. Lorenzo married a local English woman called Patricia Brown. She was also getting used to life's disappointments, having exchanged her dream of being an actress for the mundane daily theater of the suburban housewife, and whose culinary skills were forever under the ghostly shadow of her dead Puglian mother-in-law and her legendary spaghetti dishes, which in Lorenzo's eyes could never be surpassed. They had a baby girl within a year of getting married, Nora's mother, and they called her Donna. Donna grew up with her parents arguing almost continually and had consequently believed marriage was something that was not only inevitable, but also inevitably miserable. She became a secretary at a law firm and then a communications officer for Bedford Council. But then she'd had an experience which was never really discussed, at least not with Nora. She'd experienced some kind of breakdown, the first of several, that caused her to stay at home. And although she recovered, she never went back to work. There was an invisible baton of failure her mother had passed down, and Nora had held it for a long time. Maybe that was why she had given up on so many things, because she had it written in her DNA that she had to fail. Nora thought of this as the boat chugged through the Arctic waters and gulls, black-legged, it walks, according to Ingrid, flew overhead. On both sides of her family, there had been an unspoken belief that life was meant to fuck you over. Nora's dad, Jeff, had certainly lived a life that seemed to miss its target. He had grown up with only a mother, as his dad had died of a heart attack when he was two, cruelly hiding somewhere behind his first memories. Nora's paternal grandmother had been born in rural Ireland, but emigrated to England to become a school cleaner, struggling to bring in enough money for food, let alone anything approaching fun. Jeff had been bullied early on in life, but had grown big and broad enough to easily put those bullies in their place. He worked hard and proved good at football and the shot put, and in particular rugby. He played for the Bedford Blues youth team, becoming their best player, and had a shot at the big time before a collateral ligament injury stopped him in his tracks. He then became a PE teacher and simmered with quiet resentment at the universe. He forever dreamed of travel, but never did much of it beyond a subscription to National Geographic and the occasional holiday to somewhere in the Cyclades. Nora remembered him in Naxos, snapping a picture of the Temple of Apollo at sunset. Maybe that's what all lives were, though. Maybe even the most seemingly perfectly intense or worthwhile lives ultimately felt the same. Acres of disappointment and monotony and hurts and rivalries, but with flashes of wonder and beauty. Maybe that was the only meaning that mattered, to be the world witnessing itself. Maybe it wasn't the lack of achievements that had made her and her brother's parents unhappy. Maybe it was the expectation to achieve in the first place. She had no idea about any of it, really. But on that boat, she realized something. She had loved her parents more than she ever knew. And right then, she forgave them completely. I think that's plenty. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, we can start with the, the first part where he she suddenly realized she didn't want to die in the face of death and and i'm like and i think part of it is you don't want to be maimed to death by a bear but you know i think i think that could probably make you feel like oh, okay maybe i don't really want to die so uh, at least not horribly you know <clears throat> but it's like she just kind of all of a sudden gained this internal fortitude of you know not being scared for one or trying not to be scared and then really kind of seeing life through a different lens. So that's really interesting. I thought that uh, some of the things that she, I don't know, she was kind of contemplating like these ideas of like when you get in a 
when you stay in a place too long, you forget how big the world really is. But then once you sense the vastness, hope emerges and it clings to you like lichen clings to rocks. I thought that was really interesting because it is, it's a weird thing. Like when you go to places that remind you how massively huge the world is that you just there's this weird like awe kind of feeling that comes over you at least it has with me like we it's like here I mean we're rural a little bit it's not as rural as it used to be because it's becoming more suburban but when we lived in the country up uh, up in Tipton County years ago we were out in farm country and I mean, there was just vast open spaces of farmland and, and I've always just, you know, really enjoyed being in that part of the state just because it's all so open and you can see for such a distance and it just seems, I don't know why that feeling of things being bigger than yourself makes you feel more hopeful <laughs> or positive positive emotions I don't get it I, I just don't know I mean even watching like movies where people are in these places of like vast openness like I, I watched a number I don't know it's been months ago but I watched this uh this documentary on this group of women who paddled across the Pacific Ocean and yeah it, it's crazy I'm like they're like rowers, you know, this kind of rowing, this, and so they were in, they, it was like two, it was a team of four women, and so two would row for an hour, and then the other two, they'd swap out, and the other two would row for an hour, and they did this, like, continuously rotating hour or two, you know, two hours or one hour rounds all the way across the Pacific Ocean, and if you look at the Pacific Ocean on the map, I mean, it's huge, <laughs> huge the enormity of it is just unfathomable in my mind you know because I mean I have gone to some places where you know you can see a distance like we went up to Lookout Mountain uh in Chattanooga just you know last month and I mean you can see for 20 miles supposedly you can see multiple states from that point and I mean, it's a huge, you know, a really far distance and it's just like awing and, and um, just, I don't know what it is. I don't What do you guys think? It's a weird thing, right? I don't know. That word vast has um, really been in the forefront of my mind for quite some time. Um, just to stare out into space and to think about all the endless possibilities of possible scenarios, um, circumstances, whatever. It's just vast. It's such a huge word. Like, you know, the word if, the smallest word in the, you know, one of the smallest words. If is so big it contains so much anyway it's on my mind all the time i go out on the deck in the morning and look at all the amazing things and to be confronted by a polar bear with all the things i struggle with um a lot of times i'm like oh i'm so sick of this life but I don't want to leave it either. Don't want that bear to open up and take a chunk, which would be the whole thing. I guess that's all I got for now. Well, having encountered a bear myself, not a polar bear, but I had a bear sniff my head to a, to a tent. <laughs> Like you push the right. tent into my head and mm. like this. <laughs> and I, I was literally thinking. thought I was going to die right then. And to me, I was like, if I have to die, this is as good a way as any. You know, I mean, it's going to be pretty quick. <laughs> this bear's going to eat my head. But uh, 
no, oh, literally, I was in that moment, I was thanking God that uh, I had gone to bed grumbling to God about being hungry because I didn't take food and I had to catch a fish to eat and I didn't catch any fish. And I was just, I was grumbling to God that I was going to bed hungry and cold. I didn't catch any fish. And then this bear comes and sniffs my head. And I'm in that moment, I was like, thank you, God, for not letting me catch a fish because my head would, I would have smelled like fish and he would have just bit, you know, bit taking my head probably. I mean, if literally if I smelled like fish. So I was so grateful for going to bed hungry that night. <laughs> is the craziest thing but um living out there in Colorado Lori I mean you have those you have those views I miss those views so badly um I miss my mountains but it it nature is very humbling you know when I was living up on the ridge off grid where I was I had solar tape solar electric fence up to keep the bears out of my camp and also the mountain lions. And I was dealing with sub-zero temperatures, not 107, negative 117, like it's in this book, but cold enough to kill you. And it's very, it's very humbling. You know, it's, there's a part of me that really loves that kind of life. It's very simple. What you do in a day, everything is geared towards your survival. There's no wasted energy. There's no wasted uh, fuel like you have to think about. There's so many things that that you now have to focus on just to stay alive that all that other stuff out there just <laughs> doesn't mean anything anymore because now I just need to focus on this little experience here. And, um, and you do run into it situations where you might not make it out of there and it does make you very grateful and then of course in her last sentence where she's talking about her parents and how she forgives them completely I think anytime you come into a brush with death like that or, or something extremely stressful it, it reminds you of how human you are and that also enables you to allow other people to be human you know you it's like when you have kids you suddenly realize oh wow that's how hard being a parent is you know like suddenly you forgive your parents for things that they did or didn't do because you understand stresses that they're under and and everything that goes along with being a parent so um i i don't think that I mean, for me, this is a really good life, even though there's a lot of pain and there's, you know, been trauma and stuff. It's really happy in this life. There's much more happy than not happy. And that's a choice a lot of times, you know, but it plays out well. So I think this is a cool book. I, I It's working out better than I expected it to as far as discussion wise. Yeah, I like it a lot that, you know, it kind of puts, not kind of, very seriously puts things into perspective. I think it's cool that there's a lookout mountain wherever that was. Or, oh, that was Samantha. There's a lookout mountain here, too, and I bet I can see farther than you can from there. <laughs> I haven't yeah. been up in a while. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, here in Indiana, there isn't any lookout mountains, but, you know, <laughs> we've got lookout across the cornfields, you know, but you got to go to the further out country in order to see that. And that's pretty good, though, you know, <laughs> I think it is. Uh, you know, I grew up in kind of like rural Indianapolis, and at the time, it was before it all became, you know, suburban kind of um once it started growing up it's real similar to like where I am now in Brownsburg but uh you know when I was out there it, you know you could just walk and walk and walk and be all cornfields for for a long long way and it was just uh 
I, I always found that comforting, just big open sky. You know, I've, 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 I don't know, joked around with Chris over the years. I'm like, I want to retire to Texas to the big sky country. You know? <laughs> I don't really know anything about Texas. So I just know you can <laughs> get out there and there's big open sky and it goes forever, you know, so, uh, but that would be interesting. <clears throat> I but, thought Montana was big sky. I thought it was Texas. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's Montana. I'll go there it too. It doesn't matter. Big <laughs> sky everywhere. Right. I know Texas is big and open and flat. So, you know, of course, that's uh, maybe, maybe that, what is it? Oh, it's the Lone Star State, isn't it? But no, it's still known for a big open, long, big sky. So Montana is probably too cold in the wintertime for me. <clears throat> it's probably too cold in the spring and the fall too. But you know, either way, I, you know, I also want to get out at some point, get out to the Grand Canyon so I can just, you know, it's one thing I think to see things like that in, in videos or pictures and, and get an idea, but to really see it, uh, that's, that's a whole different ball game. I'm thinking at least a feel of it. And the same thing, like with the redwood trees, the big trees out on the West coast, I'd love to go out there too, just to feel the energy coming off of those thousand year old trees I mean or more I'm not even sure how old they are but just that's another thing it's like thinking about how old some aspects of this planet are and how long it took to to form them and that, that just being this little blip in that enormous amount of time it, it's it's funny because it's like this double-edged sword kind of a thing you know it's like on one edge of it you're just like I'm I have absolutely no meaning you know I'm just this blip in the the grand extreme universe of enormity and yet at the same time it it just makes you feel helpful <laughs> you know? like there's something more to it you know I don't know I don't know it's a weird thing but yeah, just like nature in general. I don't know. The ever continuingness of it, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it, when you think about sorry, Catherine, go ahead. Okay, I will. When you think about how much of a little bitty speck you are, if you go out way out in the universe. Nobody can see you. You're just a little speck. What am I here for? And the meaning and the purpose of it all, you just, I don't understand. I'm not anything special or miraculous, whatever. But I'm here for what? Go ahead, Catherine. Or like, uh, what's his name in the who? I can't remember what is, what's his name? The elephant. Horton. Horton, thank you. Mm. Like Horton and the who. <laughs> I think about that in the mornings when I'm cleaning the pool and I rescue all the insects out of there every morning. There's usually four or five crickets or something, you know, something kind of bug is in there and I'm rescued out of there and I'm thinking, Huh. I wonder if I get credit for this. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it helps me. The vastness helps me to get through challenging times because when I'm facing something that, that seems exceptionally difficult to me, or even when I'm just being a whiny, uh, privileged Karen I guess you know where I'm just upset because it's hot or something you know something simple it helps me to remember the vastness and to remember the millions and billions of people who have experienced that condition or worse typically worse you know and they got through it and I think about my ancestors and what they were put through uh, moving them off their lands and 
on the reservations and taking their culture, their language, everything, their clothing, everything away from them. It reminds me that we're much more resilient than we think we are. You know, we like to say, I can't handle this or I can't do that or whatever, when really we can. Like we're just making excuses most of the time for something. But uh, I, when we were out at Green Corn Festival, my granddaughter and I, um, you know, there were, I did, I wasn't able to dance, but she was doing dances that our ancestors had done for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, you know, the same dance in the same heat, you know, maybe not as hot that day or maybe 20 degrees worse, you know, there, we actually lucked out. The temperatures were only in the eighties and nineties when we were there, they very easily could have been in the hundred and tens like they are right now. Um, this week we're in over the hundreds. So we, people have danced those dances and lived in much, um, with much less conveniences than we have now, you know, and they made it or we wouldn't be here. Right. So that's what helps me get through. That's the vastness helps me get through the hard times. Unlimited possibilities. And I definitely am waiting for and looking for those possibilities and things to change while still being grateful for my small existence right here. You brought up like a small point in the, the permafrost section where she talked about maybe the problem with her root life had partially been its blandness. What do you guys think about that concept with you know this whole idea of you know the more blah your life is then you know maybe that's the problem you just need more adventure I don't know I definitely thought of that when you were talking about seeing the redwood trees and the Grand Canyon which I think I never get to go anywhere and I've seen both of those things and just to Breathe in the vastness and realize how amazing and a beautiful and incredible it is to be here. Yeah. I, nothing, nothing puts me in more awe than nature. Yeah. Me too, for sure. Uh, you know, I feel like anytime I just feel, bleh, you know, I just need to go outside, whatever it is, you know, even this past winter, when we had the like the negative 30, you know, degrees out, and then wind chill was like negative 50 or something. That's something I'd never experienced before, because it'd never been that cold. When I've been in Indiana, I think it may have gotten that cold the couple of years when I was in Georgia, there was a winter that was really cold up here, but that may have just been Northern Indiana. And, uh, but you know, I was just how you get in the wintertime, you're all stuffed in the house and you can't open the windows and you can't breathe the air, you know, you just breathe in the heated recirculated air and, and even going out just into that cold air. I was like, I'm just going to walk out to the mailbox, you know, <laughs> which for me I mean at this this property we've got three acres and it's basically the length of our three acres so I mean it's a pretty good walk to get out there not huge but um, in that temperature yeah in that temperature it's it's a good shot you know so I layered all up you know, and, and had my big old hooded hat my under hat and everything else and and I walked out there and just breathing in that air and feeling that insane cold I mean it just is Awing, awing. Is awing a word? <laughs> awing. We just made it one. Right. <laughs> so I don't know. I I think that well her her thought process on this whole idea of like, you know, maybe the the problem with her life just being that it was too bland is just that she was focused on the wrong things, you know? Because I mean, we all have 
parts of our lives that are just blah, you know, I mean, we just go through our days, we do our things we need to do every day, and we aren't constantly going and doing adventures or seeing new things or whatever, and um, so I think, you know, like with her, when she, further on in, in that chapter, when she's talking about how her parents it said on both sides of the family, there was kind of this unspoken belief that life was meant to fuck you over, you know? And I feel like that is kind of something that's kind of passed down generation to generation. This idea that, that life is hard and that everything's out to get you or, uh, you know, and there are hard things difficult things that we have to overcome in our lives for one reason or another but I don't think as a whole that life is all that hard we I mean it doesn't take any effort to just keep on living it just takes effort to navigate through all of the human cultural mumbo jumbo you know and and um we forget we forget it's really not that difficult to just exist like the trees and the birds and 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 all of those things and and or the earth in general you know and I think that's kind of the thing is we just get stuck in this wrong mindset if you will and and when you're feeling depressed it's hard to get your get your ass up and and change that perspective you know because you just want to lay there or you just are like oh I just uh, I just need a nap you know and um, I'm just gonna go sleep until I feel better and I don't know sometimes that works and sometimes you wake up and you don't feel any better at all and you're like ah I just want to go back to sleep just over it but but then you could go outside and you're just like ah the birds are singing and everything's wonderful and it all seems great and you know or you can listen to a song and and then everything just uplifts you I mean it's it's a weird, a weird dynamic that we live in and all dependent on what we're focused on. You know, I've been having a lot of conversations with my granddaughter recently because she has so many little irrational fears and, um, and then, or seemingly to me, irrational fears, you know, it was like the other day, we're trying to read a book. And like every single word was tripping her up that was bigger than, you know, three letter word or whatever. And she was getting so frustrated and she's just like throwing her head down. And I'm like, quit telling yourself it's hard. <laughs> I'm like, tell yourself it's going to be easier the more that you do it, you know? And so I'll like keep going through these different conversations of, you know, what are you saying to yourself in your head? What are you, what are you saying right now? You know, that you're, afraid of or upset about or whatever it is and um, and so she's been listening and actually it's been helping quite a bit so I've been really excited about that but it's just a great reminder and even from a young age that kids just have this they get stuck in this mindset or in these um, patterns like my grandson he gets stuck in in he's got some pretty significant patterns that he keeps getting stuck in. And it is, a lot of it is behavioral responses. And so, you know, I've been trying to work on just doing different things to do a pattern interrupt, whether it's just saying his name really loud three times fast or clapping or <laughs> I don't know, poke him, tickle him, whatever it is, just like a pattern interrupt because he, he just gets into these modes and then it just escalates and uh, but it is it's just a pattern it's like a picked up mental pattern that um, you know and little kids they don't realize they can break the pattern but you know we just need to remind ourselves that we can break the pattern and if we have kids around we can help them break the pattern I am going off onto a tangent so anyway no, I'm thinking. Oh, no, it's true. That... <laughs> Three women just here stepping on each other. Go ahead, Catherine.
I said what I had to say. I was just telling her she was saying she was going off on a tangent. I'm like, no, that's that's good stuff. I mean, we have to. Yeah. I'm helping my granddaughter with the same thing. And I was going to say that the more knowledge that humans are getting and everyone competing on social media and all this being bombarded with so many images, so many thoughts. And then that little voice in the back of our head, our ego, our personality, whatever, that's always talking da, 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 back there. And it's not good. And I don't know how we continue expanding and growing in this vast universe being bombarded with more and more and more it's too much I don't know well and so many of us you know spend so much time indoors where like you said you're not getting fresh air you you're you're enclosed in these fair day cages more or less you know like it's i don't know there's some science that says on some level we do photosynthesis or like a plant i mean we need the sun so i think that's why getting outside just helps us feel so much better because we're we're literally shifting our energy by changing our environment and going from like a not a I'm not saying that the house has a negative energy as far as bad vibes but there's just no energy or it's or it's not the right kind of energy you know it's like electrical energy and stuff whereas when you get outside you know you're I mean we're we're animals we're we're meant to be in the wild so to speak you know in the elements and our bodies really do draw electrically from those things we're because we're made of energy so it makes perfect sense that and then but then i should say there are humans that um are afraid of nature or you know you can have them in the most beautiful place in the world and they'll be sitting there on their phone looking at something or playing a game. You know, when I used to pick up people at the airport in Denver, giving them a ride back to Boulder or something, and the, we'd have these gorgeous, majestic mountain views, and they'd be on their phone, and I'd be like, put those phones down <laughs> on that window. <laughs> because it's, you're never going to see that again. Like, it's just, I don't know, it feeds my soul and in a way that nothing else does and i tried really hard to see the the uh, meteor showers that were going on this last week and stuff but we had so much cloud cover i never i got to see one <laughs> so that was good but um if you can get out you know if you're in a place that's dark enough and you don't have cloud cover if you can watch a meteor shower that will kind of remind you of that vastness too you know or some of the pictures that nasa takes oh my gosh i mean it just blows my mind and we're we're like you said we're so unimportant and yet we're so important to each other it, it, i mean it's just so amazing to me how much um community means to people you know even though we all as humans we all have our issues or whatever when times get tough you know when people drop all the bs and come together and help one another that's something you see a lot in certain states that have um, a lot of natural disasters and stuff you get to experience that a little more but uh you know, we do the best we can as little specks. Thank goodness there's a Horton out there somewhere looking after us.
Hooray for Horton! Hooray for Horton! <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> right. Some Horton's carrying us around on, on his, in a flower. Saving us from the raging river or whatever is coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just don't even know. Mm -hmm. It's so important to realize that my little bitty existence and I'm sitting on my deck staring out at the vast open skies and these clouds and I'm seeing all this art in it and I'm thinking in my mind that that's just another dimension and time somewhere else a timeline that what if that cloud is somebody's rocket ship shooting across and leaving a trail behind and um, it just blows my mind. Yeah, I'm just happy we have all these different things to, to contemplate and talk about <laughs> you know i don't know it's interesting it's a good book though like you were saying Catherine. it's it's i, I wasn't sure how the conversation was going to be able to work around it and, and i feel like each little bit has some really uh, good topics that we can cover and go you know discuss so it's been good it's so relatable you know, like the whole generational passing down, life is a disappointment. That's true in a lot of families, especially those of us that have grandparents from, or even parents from the Great Depression age, you know. Um, well, if you're our age, our parents were from that. I know, that's what I mean, yeah. So, I mean, pictures of my dad when when he was a child, they're just... Oh, like they could be used in a in a horror movie or something. They're just gaunt and you know very sad looking, and so we're we're pretty privileged in this lifetime. I think I know I am. I acknowledge that three hundred percent. I'm yeah. spoiled rotten. <laughs> right. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Well. It's been a good get d discussion today, guys. We can go ahead and wrap this up. And um, it's been a good chat. Again, we are reading the book, uh, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. Next week, we will continue the reading and discussion. And if you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you. So you can find us. Just look for Mindset Mastery Collective. If you Google that, you'll find our website. You'll find us on Facebook. You'll find YouTube, all of those different things. And if you're watching this on a YouTube video, there'll be links below the video where you can join our Facebook group. Uh, and in our Facebook group, there's links to share the pinned post. We'll show you how to watch all our replays. And it has the link to get into this Zoom meeting, which we meet together. We get on here at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific, every just about every Saturday morning. And then we do the recording and it gets posted later. So we'd love to have you anyway. That's it for now. Have a great, awesome, amazing week. We'll see you next time on the Saturday Morning Mastermind. Bye for now.